Well, church family, if you would, take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 3. As we continue our journey, the whole church and the whole word for a whole year. Uh, And so today uh, we're going to look at a key transition moment in the early history of Israel. But as we get there... Uh, you know, my kids are home for summer, got one home from college, got everybody gathered around the dinner table, and I was reminded of just those rich family conversations that happened there. And a couple of years ago, my kids were really into riddles. Uh, and so I printed out a list of the best riddles of all time, brought them home, and we had some fun with those at the dinner table. Uh, so let me give you a couple of those this morning. What grows when it eats but dies when it drinks? Fire, all right? Heard somebody say it. All right, here's one for you. What occurs once every minute, twice every moment, but not once in a thousand years? You guys are like, it's summer. Like, don't do this to us, right? The letter M. How about that? Some of you, it's just occurring to you now, right? So I get it. Sunday morning, a little, little slow on the take. It, it's fun to pause and think about these things, but I want you to think about this one for a minute. What's offered by many, received by few, but is invaluable? The answer is today's theme, wisdom. And we're going to see Solomon ask of something very important of the Lord, an example, a model in this moment of Solomon's life for us to follow. We get that story in 1 Kings chapter 3. Would you stay with me in honor of God's word as we read this passage together? 1 Kings 3, beginning in verse 7. Lord my God, you have now made your servant king in my father David's place. Yet I'm just a youth with no experience in leadership. Your servant is among your people you have chosen, a people too many to be numbered. Or counted. So give your servant a receptive heart to judge your people and to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge his, this great people of yours? Now it pleased the Lord that Solomon had requested this. So God said to him, because you have requested this and did not ask, did not ask for long life or riches for yourself or the death of your enemies... But you ask discernment for yourself to administer justice. I will therefore do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and understanding heart so that there has never been anyone like you before and never will be again. But in addition, I will give you what you did not ask for, both riches and honor, so that no king will be your equal during your entire life. If you walk in my ways, And keep my statutes and commands just as your father David did. I will give you a long life. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, it's something that we all desperately need. But it is in short supply in our world today. So God, would you give us wisdom to walk in your ways to live out our witness, as we sang about just a few moments ago, that we would shine like stars in a dark world and that we would use that light to point people to the light whose name is Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. So as we continue in the storyline of Scripture, we remain in Act 2, God's covenant people, scene 5, kings and the prophets, as God continues to shape for himself a covenant people. Now, we've just spent several weeks in the life of David. Naturally, there's more narrative material about the life of David than any other person in the entire scripture. So we get to see in depth the ups and downs of David's life. When he was obedient to the Lord, when God's, he was attentive to the spirit that God put in him, we got to see David do some amazing things. But we also saw David struggle at moments, just as we all struggle, even if the spirit is in us. And this is the moment where the baton is passed from King David to his son, King Solomon. And so our first point this morning is this. Walk in God's ways. David's last words to Solomon. 
If we go back just a, a couple of chapters into chapter 2, we see the, the ending of David's time on earth. Uh, the book of Kings opens with David. He's old and he's frail. His health is failing him, and so his oldest son, Adonijah, feels like it's his time, it's his moment to take over the kingdom. Whereas Absalom tried to kill his father, Adoniah instead just decides that he is going to ignore him completely. And so he begins a coup. The prophet Nathan and David's wife Bathsheba are the ones who alert David to this reality. And so David immediately anoints Solomon, who David predicted would be the next king of Israel as king. In the beginning of chapter 2, he gives these words to Solomon. As the time approached for David to die, he ordered his son Solomon. As for me, I am going the way of all the earth. Be strong and be a man. And keep your obligation to the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to keep his statutes, commands, ordinances, and decrees. This is written in the law of Moses so that you will have success in everything that you do and wherever you turn. Echoes of Joshua in those words from David. And so that the Lord will fulfill his promise that he made to me. If your sons guard their way to walk faithfully before me with all their heart and all their soul, you will never fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. So important words that David delivers to Solomon. And so we know for all of David's achievements, for his defeat of Goliath, his defeat of the Philistines, his conquering of Jerusalem, his bringing the ark to Jerusalem, all of the important things that David did, as we've already established, remember that the most important thing about David was not what he did for God. It's the promise that God made to him. The same is true for you and me. Remember, we are not saved by making promises to God. That would be salvation by works. Instead, we're saved by grace. Believing God's promises to us. What God has done for us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that needs to stay front and center as we continue to think about the storyline of the Old Testament and what God has been doing and what he's going to do. And so in this moment, David points to that covenant He says, Solomon, God has made me a promise. Now walk in his ways. God's going to keep his promise one way or the other. There's going to be one of our descendants on the throne of Israel. The family line is going to survive. But there are many sons, there are many people that that could be accomplished through. So you walk in my ways. And here's what's kind of sad and a little ironic. Right after that, David gives him a list of enemies that he wants Solomon to take out. And so a little bit like the Godfather, right, on his deathbed, David's like, there's some unfinished business, son, that I need you to take care of. And that gives us an example of the the, the struggle of David's heart. Remember that after David's affair with Bathsheba, that God told him, the sword will always be with your house. And that's certainly the case. So we come to verse 10, and it says, Then David rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. You can go see David's tomb to this day. I was there just about a year ago at that very site there in Jerusalem. The length of time David reigned over Israel was 40 years. Seven years in Hebron, 33 years in Jerusalem. Solomon sat on the throne of his father David and his kingship was firmly established. And so it's fascinating, isn't it? We come to the end of great David's life and there's little fanfare. You expect there to be a massive funeral. The Bible speaks of no such thing. Instead, David's time is simply passed, and the baton passes to his son Solomon. It's a reminder to all of us that one day for us, unless the Lord comes back before, our time will come too. The baton will pass to someone else, and God's faithfulness, well, it will endure from generation to generation. And so David tells his son, walk in God's ways. But keep in mind that the big thing in focus here is that a son of David is on the throne. Step one, God made a promise. He's keeping his promise. Point two for us this morning is this. We need to seek God's wisdom. In the passage that we read, we're going to see Solomon's request. Now what's interesting is, after David's death, Solomon indeed carries out his father's wishes. He begins kingdom building. 
So chapter three opens up with an interesting hint about how Solomon's heart, right, was divided. And so Solomon makes a marriage and a marriage alliance with Pharaoh in Egypt. Pretty fascinating. On one hand, it's a mixed bag. On one hand, the reality is, is Israel is now being recognized as a superpower. Egypt, worldwide superpower in that part of the world. And so Pharaoh wants an alliance with Israel, that Israel had come that far that it's now an established kingdom. Of course, God warned his people about alliances with other countries, about alliances with Egyptians in particular. And so we're going to see that play out in coming weeks. But in this moment, we see Solomon building the kingdom, doing what kings do. He goes to worship God at the high places. Now, other places in scripture, that's going to be forbidden because that's where the pagan people worshiped, on top of mountains. But we don't have the temple yet. So it seems that this is acceptable to God in this moment. He receives Solomon's sacrifice, and then he asks Solomon a question. In verse 5, at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night, and God said, ask, what should I give you? Our God is a gracious God. He is a giving God. But you need to understand, and I need to understand, that this is not God playing genie in a bottle, right? I'm going to grant you three wishes. That's not what this is about. It's about God keeping his covenant promises. Do you remember all the way back with Abraham? That the covenant, the sign of the covenant, God's promise to his people would involve three primary things. One, offspring. That Israel would grow into a mighty nation. And indeed, look what's taken place. There are now millions of Israelites. They are a mighty nation recognized by other superpowers. God has kept his word about that. Number two, they would inhabit the land. They are now firmly established in their homeland. They have Jerusalem for their capital city. God has kept that promise. What's the third part of the promise? That God would bless or be with his people in a personal way. Here we see God extending that blessing to David's son, Solomon. Solomon, ask. I want to give you what you need in order to rule your kingdom. Now we know at this point Solomon has a father-in-law named Pharaoh. And so the question for the discerning reader is, what's Solomon going to ask? Is he going to act like a Pharaoh in this moment? Is he going to ask for greater power? Is he going to ask for God to smite his enemies? Is he going to ask for riches? What is it that Solomon is going to ask for? Well, we've already read it in the text. Solomon in verse 6, replies, You've shown great and faithful love to your servant, my father, David. Again, that word love, loving kindness. You have shown your grace. You have shown your plan to my father, David. So Solomon begins at the right place, remembering what God has done for his father and the promise that he made to him. Because he walked before you in faithfulness, righteousness, and integrity, you continued this great faithful love for him by giving him a son to sit on his throne as it is today. Now, does God know these things? Of course. And God knows when we bring before him in our prayers the reality of our life and where we're at. But Solomon states this because Solomon needs to be reminded of it in this moment. Just like you and I need to remember the faithfulness. We need to rehearse the faithfulness of God to remember what God's done to bring us to this point. And so I love Solomon's humility in this moment. Lord God, you've now made your servant king in my father's David's place. Yet I am just a youth, Solomon, probably about 20 years old at this time, with no experience in leadership. And your servant is among your people you have chosen, a people too many to be numbered or counted. Isn't that interesting? The story we looked at last week, David got in trouble. Why? Because he tried to number and count the people. Now Solomon says, I'm not going to even try. But I'm going to acknowledge that, man, there are too many for me to lead in my own wisdom, in my own strength. I'm 20 years old. I'm overwhelmed by this reality. It's easy sometimes to be overwhelmed. My predecessor, Mike Glenn, was fond of saying, if you're an inch over your head or a mile over your head, you're in over your head. It's a good statement. 
It stuck with me. I feel that way sometimes myself. <laughs> but the reality is it's easy for us to be overwhelmed. I read the story this week in one of the commentaries. But back in the 1920s, a couple of shoe companies sent salesmen into the heart of Africa. And so they were both equally overwhelmed. But one shoe salesman sent back a message, telegraphed at home, said, get me out of here. We can't sell shoes here. Nobody wears any shoes. The other salesman sent back a message. Send me all the shoes you've got. Nobody here wears any shoes. You see, who are you trusting in? How do you see the situation? Solomon reads this situation rightly. God, you've put me in a situation in which I am responsible for this vast number of people that you've entrusted to me. So would you give me your wisdom? Would you give me your perspective? He asks in this passage for for great discernment. He says, so give your servant a receptive heart. That word in the original language comes from the Hebrew words to hear and obey, which come from the same root word, which should be a reminder to us. If we are to truly hear, receive the word of God in our hearts, it also means we must obey it. The two go together. In other words, there's no true hearing unless we obey. There's no true hearing unless we follow through on the word. And so Solomon is asking God to give him a heart that not only receives the word, as we sang about already this morning, but also is willing to act on that word. Give your servant a receptive heart to judge your people and to discern between good and evil. That's what leaders are called to do. And so we need to remember that in our world today, that leaders that God puts in place, they are God's agent to discern what? Between good and evil. It's why we need to pray for our leaders. And if we're placed in a position of leadership, we need to remember that with that great privilege comes great responsibility. Too many of our leaders have forgotten that, that that's what it's about. But in this moment, Solomon had not. And so God is pleased by his request. It begs an interesting question of us, one that I hope you'll take home with you today and ask the people that you're sitting around the table with or the people that you go to lunch with or the people that you share life with. Here's a great question for your life group, for your family today. If God offered you a blank check, what would you ask him for? It's a good test of the heart, isn't it? As far as we know, there's no audience but God and Solomon. Solomon could have asked for anything, for God to bless him with anything in this moment. But Solomon's heart at this moment is to ask God for a wise and discerning heart so that he can discern between good and evil as he leads the people. As several have put it, if God answered your prayer today, whatever little prayer it is that just bubbled up in your heart, if God answered your wish today, would it change your world or would it change the world? Would it just change your life for the better? Or would it change others' lives for the better? That's a gauge of your heart. It's a gauge of your sanctification, of where you're at with the Lord. And it was a gauge in this moment of where Solomon was as well. And so in this moment, the people are in awe of Solomon's knowledge. And he's off to a good start. So how do we follow his lead? How do we put this into practice? Here's our third point this this morning. We need to seek the greater Solomon. As with all kings in the Bible, the kings point to the great king in one way or another, either by positive or negative example. And so we see Solomon pointing us to Christ, the great king who is our wisdom. Now we need to define wisdom biblically. A lot of us think that wisdom is just being really smart. Well, let's all be blunt. We all know some smart people who make some stupid decisions, don't we? Right? Being smart, accumulating facts, having intelligence, having a high score on aptitude tests does not equal wisdom. Wisdom conventionally, right, is knowledge rightly applied. But it's interesting that biblically this Hebrew word for wisdom means that we not only can put knowledge in action, but we live in a skillful way. Peter Lightheart, a theologian, notes that in the Hebrew, 
Wisdom is more closely associated with the work of a craftsman, a carpenter, than it is with the mystic. Let me say that again. In Hebrew, the word for wisdom, it's not this mystical idea. It's more associated with skill and art and craft, specifically that of a wood maker, than it is with a mystic. In other words, wisdom is the art of skillful living. It's taking the truth that God has woven into the fabric of our world, and it's using it, and in a way that's attractive and fitting and beautiful. One of the commentaries I was reading talked about the fact that wisdom is a lot like hard candy. Anybody remember hard candies? This guy in my home church who used to pass those things out to all of the kids, I was excited, would line up on a Sunday morning, right, to get a little, piece of, uh, a little piece of hard candy in our hand. And so we would get that hard candy, but he would always warn us, right? Don't bite down on it. Don't chew it. Don't try to devour it. Instead, you had to do what? You had to slowly absorb it. And then its sweetness became evident. And wisdom, wisdom works the, much the same way. It's something you have to spend time with. And the more time you spend with it, the more it's revealed to you. And so I love that commentator Tony Morita gives us several dimensions of worship, of, uh, of uh, wisdom. What is it? It begins, of course, in worship. And as Solomon gave us the Proverbs. We're going to look more at one of the famous Proverbs next week. But how does Proverbs begin? Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. After the introduction, Solomon writes, The Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All reverence, respect for God and his greatness, that is the beginning of wisdom. That verse goes on to say, fools despise wisdom and knowledge and instruction. And so, as I said a moment ago, you can be intelligent. You can be great at trivial pursuit. You can have more degrees on your wall than a thermometer. But if you don't have wisdom, if you don't respect the Lord, that's where you have to begin. What does it say in Matthew 6, Jesus instructed us, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then everything else will be added to you as well. It comes from that same idea that we fear God first, we respect God first, we have all for him first, and then from that, everything flows. We know that the second dimension of wisdom is insight. You could say understanding. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 say, Don't abandon wisdom, and she will watch over you. Solomon personifies wisdom in the Proverbs. Love her, and she will guard you. Wisdom is supreme, so get wisdom. And whatever else you get, get understanding. You see, we need to have God's eyes to see God's way. And that's what wisdom gives us. Well, where does that wisdom come from? How do we apply it? It's discernment. Discernment. We see in chapter 16 of Proverbs, verse 21, anyone with a wise heart is discerning. They know how to apply that wisdom. There's a little statement that we have tried to teach our kids so that they learn to use their words wisely. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But it's called the three-question rule. We teach them them to ask this little statement. Does this need to be said? Question number one. Before I open my mouth, does this need to be said? Question number two, does this need to be said by me? Am I the one who's supposed to say this thing? Do I have the authority? Do I have the position? Do I need to be the one to communicate this? Does this need to be said by me? Question three, right now. That's what gets us into a lot of trouble. Sometimes it's the timing, it's the moment. So we try to teach our kids to say to themselves, before I open my mouth, does this need to be said by me right now? And I've added a fourth, we've added a fourth in this way. Because there's a right way to say things. There's a right place to communicate things. That place is not always your Facebook post or your Instagram We have to think carefully in this day and age, right? Does this need to be said by me right now in this way? Hopefully that's a pathway towards discernment where our children begin to learn. 
It's, there's a moral dimension to it as well, right? Wisdom and purity always go together in the Psalms. And there is a justice component. The wise receive prudent instruction in righteousness, judge, justice, and integrity. And then there's the skill part. And that's putting it all together. So, I know your question, right? How do we get this? How do we pursue it? Well, it's one of my favorite verses of the Bible. James chapter 1, verse 5. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, can I be totally transparent with you as your pastor? All the time. I'm going to the Lord saying, God, I'm raising my hand right here, right? First part of that verse. I need your wisdom. I believe in this moment that's what Solomon was doing. This is one of Solomon's better moments as a king. Showing some humility, just simply saying, God, I, there are things too great for me, too big for me. I lack wisdom. I'm putting my hand in the air. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. Complicated, isn't it? It's not. But what does it require? A humble heart. An acknowledgement that we don't have all the answers. Realizing that God is wiser than our search engines. That God is better than Bing. He's better than Google. And by the way, do you know what the most frequently used search engine is now? It's not Google, it's YouTube. We have an entire generation that's trying to glean all of their wisdom by YouTubing it. Sure, YouTube is great if you want to learn how to fix your car. YouTube's great if you want to learn a few facts about history. But YouTube cannot give you the wisdom that life requires. And so God says, ask, ask. I'm a good father. I delight in answering your prayers. So ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly and it will be given to him. But ask in faith without doubting. Ask in faith without doubting. Know that when you go to God and you ask for his wisdom, he's faithful to give it. But don't doubt him on it. And you've got to trust his word on it as well. So we ask, we study scripture, Proverbs 7, 5. Solomon writes, my son, obey my words and treasure my commands. Paul tells Timothy, 2 Timothy three fifteen, scripture is able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now there's wisdom that matters. Wisdom that leads you to acknowledge your sin, to, to know how God made a way in Christ Jesus for us to be saved. We get wisdom in biblical community to come around others who can be a sounding board. Proverbs 13, 20, the one who walks with the wise will become wise, but a companion of fools will suffer harm. And we walk, of course, as I've already mentioned, in humility, being teachable. Proverbs eleven two: 2, when arrogance comes, disgrace follows, but with humility comes wisdom. But here's the greatest truth of all. Wisdom is not merely a set of principles. It's not merely a set of precepts. Brothers and sisters, wisdom has come to us in a person. And when you know Christ, you can know wisdom. 1 Corinthians Chapter 1, verse 30, Paul writes this. It is from him that you are in Christ Jesus who became wisdom from God for us. Our righteousness, our sanctification and redemption in order that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You see, the people were in awe of Solomon's gift of wisdom. But they also acknowledged that that gift came from the Lord. When people watch us as brothers and sisters in Christ make wise choices, living wisely in a world that is unwise, we stand out and people look at us and they're like, they may be smart, but there's something different about them. And that difference is Jesus. So here's what I want us to do this morning. Would you make your seat an altar? Would you make the place where you're at a place where you today, as James exhorts us to, ask God for the wisdom that you need? What is the one thing right now that's in front of you that you don't have an answer for? What is the one thing that you were desperate to figure out? What is the one thing that, like Solomon, makes you feel overwhelmed? God, this is too big, it's too great, I feel in over my head, I can't do this alone. And there, would you just open your hands and would you say, Lord, I'm asking, 
today. In Christ Jesus, who is wisdom personified, that by his grace, his mercy, his power, that he would give me the discernment that I may need. Some of you have some big choices coming up. Some of you need wisdom for relationships. Some of you have a decision that's on the horizon. Whatever it is today, would you pause? And would we follow Solomon's example and saying, God, out of all the things I got asked for today, in the name of Jesus, I ask for your wisdom and your truth. Let me give you a few moments to do that right now. Lord Jesus, I love the beauty of this moment. That all across this worship center, in living rooms, in homes, wherever people are watching, that we are asking. We're not Googling, we're not YouTubing, we're not turning to advice columns or talk shows, but instead we are calling on your spirit by the power of Jesus, to give us the wisdom that we need. So Lord Jesus, today, thank you for your promise. Thank you that we've seen your promise fulfilled throughout Scripture. That from David to Solomon, you make a promise, you keep a promise. From Solomon all the way to Jesus, God, you brought us an ultimate king who would not just present us with a set of ideas, but would be wisdom personified. So God, as we look at his life, as we get closer to Jesus, may we look more like him. And it's in his name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Would you stand with us as we come to our benediction today? If you need someone to pray with you for wisdom, our prayer partners will be down front. If you need to 